Hey guys, how's it going? It's Craig here. I am standing in front of my board game collection. Um, it's a bit of a struggle to get games to the table at the moment, as you know. But I thought I would give a quick rundown of what I think are the 10 best games in my collection. Obviously it's a subjective view and uh, it's pretty tough to, to rate different games against each other when games, the enjoyment in games comes a lot from the environment you play them in and player counts and who are you playing with, what are you drinking, what time of day it is even, so it's, it's pretty tough to say one game is better than another, but I'll give it a go, try and get my top 10 out. Now it's interesting, my top 4 were pretty obvious to me, I think that uh, while I was looking at the collection the top 4 never changed, so to me the top 4 uh, stand well ahead of the bottom 6 in this top 10, but it doesn't stop to say the bottom 6 are bad, I mean it's still in the top 10 in my collection, I've got about 130 games here, so um, yeah, I mean, the bottom six of this top ten probably could have been put in any order, depending on um, the day I play them and those factors that I mentioned before. So, yeah, we'll try and get through the top ten. Um, I don't know how long this is going to be. I might just do the top, uh, the bottom six of the top ten now and do the top top four later. And you guys can guess what you think of my top four games, maybe, in between the two videos. So, yeah, here we go. So, my number 10 is actually The Others. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's a 1v all, a uh, bit of a dice chucker, more of an Ameritrash kind of game. Generally not my type of game, but this one is particularly good. Um, Eric Lang's a designer, he's, he's features predominantly on my shelf. He's actually not my favourite designer by a long shot, but this is a game I do particularly enjoy. Every time I've got this to the table, we've had a really, really good time with it. Um, the, the heroes pick from a litter of heroes, and the sin picks whichever sin they want to choose. It's, it's supposed to be the seven sins or whatever. It's a really strange theme, really stupid actually theme, but that doesn't matter. Um, but it is a really tight game. And you know, every game I play with this comes down to the last dice roll, the last three or four dice rolls that really, really weigh heavily on the result of the game. And it's just one of those games where everyone sort of stands up. The dice get rolled, everyone cheers or everyone groans, depending on what the result of the dice is. And, there are moments that are really hard to recreate with any of the games in this collection, and that is why it is my number 10. Like I said, though, the theme is stupid. Um, it's based on the Seven Sins. They could have just made it Heroes vs. Monsters and called it something interesting, but it's based on the Seven Sins, and in the box you only get two. Two Sins in a game about Seven Sins. Well done. That is my number 10. The others. My number 9 is actually Street Masters. Now I don't actually have the core box of Street Masters because we've got it set up, playing it at the moment. It's a cooperative game, the missus loves it, so that probably weighs a little bit on my judgement of it as well, but it is a brilliant game, Kickstarter exclusive game. I think you can buy it from their store now, it's a US based store I think. So it's going to be pretty expensive to get into Australia. It's hard to get. They're probably going to do another Kickstarter sometime. But um, yeah, Street, Street Masters is like a cooperative romp. A bit of a Street Fighter, Double Dragon sort of a setup um, where you pick your fighters. Each fighter has their own deck of cards specific to them. They will have their own abilities, their own play style, similar to like a Street Fighter, what you would expect. And you pick a villain. There's a whole series of, of villains which come with their own goons and and their own decks that you'll be up against and you'll also be up against the the stage elements as well during the game which will which will every stage you pick will have uh, a different deck of its own as well so you have your, your hero decks your story deck oh sorry your stage deck and your enemy deck and you'll be working through the game it sounds heavy but it's actually not too bad it's pretty easy it makes a lot of sense and um, it's a lot of fun to play and mrs loves it which is great it's always a plus and um yeah, we've got that set up at the moment, so it just goes to show that that is a game we thoroughly enjoy. Um, it comes with a lot of stuff. If you get the Kickstarter version and you get all the stretch goals, you just you have so much stuff. It's very much a lifestyle game, which refers to a game that you can just leave set up and you can play it and play it and play it and play it and never get sick of it and constantly see new things. And the game's always evolving um, based on what you choose and what you do in the game. And there's a lot of this game we haven't even seen before you played it. 10, 15 times, maybe 20 times, and we've, you know, we've barely scratched the surface of what's, what's in the box. So, Street Masters gets a tick for me. That is my number nine. 
My number eight. Spirit Island. Now this is a heavy, heavy cooperative game. And actually this is the third game in a row that has cooperative elements in it. So I'm starting to see a bit of a theme here. But I think this may be... No, it's not the last cooperative game, but it's close. So this is an interesting, interesting game. It's actually quite hard to get to, this, to the table because it is so heavy. It is, it is simple. If you looked at it, if you look at the map, I, mean, I don't know if you can see that, but you can see there's a pretty basic looking map with a couple of little things going on there. But the weight of this game doesn't come from... Uh, the difficulty of rules as such, the weight of this game, or the difficulty of this game comes from the strategic aspects of this game. And to play this game well and to succeed in this game, you need to be switched on and you need to cooperate really, really well with your teammate, which is great because it, it obviously encourages a lot of table talk and you will not win. If you don't have a lot of table talk, if you play with someone who just wants to sit there quietly and do their own thing, it's going to be a struggle and you're probably going to lose regardless of how good that player is. So it really, really encourages a lot of table talk, which ends up being a lot of fun. And again, this game has a lot of variability as well. So if you find that you're, you've picked a couple of uh, spirits, which is the idea of the game, everyone goes in their own spirit. There's a whole bunch to select from. If you find some spirits that you find are really powerful, you can actually adjust the enemies to suit. And there's a huge scaling of the difficulties of your enemies. Um, ranging right from the, the base starting point of the game, which is almost like a beginner level, which is actually really hard when you start out, you probably will lose your first couple of games of this if you haven't played it, all the way up to like a, a 9, ranging from all the way from 0 to 9, and you can go all the way up to 9 and you'll get your ass kicked. But those that are good at the game, probably play it on 9, probably have a lot of fun, maybe win some games, and it just goes to show that the developer of this game has put a lot of effort in to making this a long-term game in people's collections, and I appreciate that. It's a beautiful game. Board looks a bit boring when you first get it out, I suppose, but the more you play it, the more you appreciate the board and how simple it is. Um, the, I mean, the interesting thing is probably your spirits and your decks, the artwork on the cards is absolutely beautiful in this game, so you really can't criticize the way it looks on the table once you get going, once your cards start getting out, it's absolutely beautiful. Spirit Island is a wonderful game. Highly recommend it. If you're into heavy games, it is a heavy game. That is my number eight, Spirit of Island. So my number seven is actually Keyflower, the first competitive game on this list. It's an interesting game, Keyflower. I really love Keyflower. Um, you can play a full game of Keyflower in around 45 minutes with two players. Most of my games I play with two players. With the misses, obviously, I do bring games to the site, and we play with three or four players, sometimes five players. I have played this with three or four players, it still plays really well, but uh, probably takes a little bit longer than uh, the 45 minutes, maybe maybe it takes the same amount of time with four, I mean you double the time for four, I mean to say, so gives you an idea of how long this game goes for, but with the, with the two players we set this up at home and we can play a game for 45 minutes, which is excellent because we can just leave it on the table and every time we want to play, just shuffle the season tiles and off we go again. So the way this game works is you, you it's played over the four seasons of the year. You'll have a series of tiles come out in each season which you'll be bidding on. You have your own uh, player screen. I don't know if you've ever seen. You get your own little player screens here and you'll be hiding, hiding your coloured meeples behind your player screen. Um, it's quite an interesting mechanic because your opponent doesn't know what you've got. You don't know what your opponent's got. You have some rough idea based on what they used to bid in the last rounds, for example, um, because you'll get your meeples back if you lose a bid or if you use your workers on your tiles, you'll get them back. So you have some rough idea of what your opponent's got, which will really affect how you use your own meeples, because you obviously want to... You're trying to build your own little farmstead here, or your own town, whatever they call it, and if you win a bid for a tile during a season, you'll get that in your town. Um, and some of those tiles you really, really, really want. Um, there may be three or four a season come out that you really, really, really want, but you may not have enough meeples to outbid your opponent on them, so you've really got to prioritise what you want. You may also know that your opponent doesn't have many red meeples, for instance, so you might bid two red meeples on something rather than three or four, and you may guarantee yourself that tile. So it's an interesting mechanic being able to bid with hidden information. I really love that. It's great fun. Um, Keyflower, my problem is 
It's really ugly on the table, and people don't like that next to it. Now, my number six. Tigris and Euphrates. Tigris and Euphrates is an absolute peach of a game, actually. This one's pretty unlucky to miss out on my top four, I'd say. I know it's number six and not number five. You'll see later why. But Tigris and Euphrates is a, is a real, real good game. It's quite heavy. Um, it's probably up there with Spirit Island on the weight of games or the complexity of games. This one's more of a rules-based complexity rather than a strategy-based complexity. It's a really, really um, difficult game strategically, but you can still bluff your way through it a little bit, I suppose. If you're not the most strategic player, you can still do well in Tigris and Euphrates. Um, it's got some really, really interesting um, design elements to it. Rainer Knizzi is the designer. He is a very famous designer. I don't, I don't know whether this is the one that really was the breakout game for him. I'm not a big history buff on board games, but this is a really, really, really tight, really good game. Again, ugly as hell on the table. You know, I don't know, this might be a 90s game or an early thousands game. I'm not really sure. I mean, this is probably a reprint, so that date there, 2014, is probably wrong, but it's pretty ugly on the table. But man, is this is this a tight game. I always enjoy playing this. If I don't do well in this game, I've only got myself to blame. I've had people that crack it over this game, because in this game you're building your own little empire. You can be doing well based on the tiles that you draw and the temples that you build. You think you're great, you're having a great time in your little empire, and then someone just comes along and absolutely annihilates you and takes everything that you've got and you're left with nothing for the rest of the game, pretty much. And you've only really got yourself to blame, because that's the kind of game that it is. It's actually a war game. And if you set yourself up to be a target, then you've got to expect to be targeted a little bit. No one's going to just let you sit there and claim victory points every turn. So that's the beauty of this game. You can really cripple people if they don't set themselves up well. You can set yourself up nicely. If you're really, really strategic, you can really set yourself down, sink your feet into the ground where you are, and you can just keep claiming victory points, and you'll have the rest of the table talking about how they're going to take you over and they may not be able to do it and there's nothing better than that in a board game. Tigris and Euphrates is a fantastic game, it's a shame it's so ugly, it could really do it with a reprint. That's my number six. Now my number five, I'll try and get this out of that's Pat on the My number five is the seventh content. I'm probably not going to hold this for very long because it's actually really heavy. Uh, Another difficult game to get. There, they are, there are still some Kickstarter copies available on their Australia shop. I think they were um, extra prints from the Kickstarter run. Um, it's basically just a card game. There's not really many components to it. Um, this box is just full of cards. This box is pretty much just full of cards. There are some little miniatures and things in there, but they're fairly... You don't really need them. Um, Seven Continents, and it's an exploration game. You'll be, it's a cooperative game. You'll be heading out onto the continent. You'll be picking a curse at the start of the, or multiple curses at the start of your game that you'll be trying to solve. It's a bunch of puzzles spread out throughout this massive world. And you've got to really be switched on as you play, trying to pick up all the clues along the way, exploring this mysterious island, writing down what you've seen. Um, we we keep up with it by drawing what we see as well, so that when we do find clues for other curses later on, because we'll be visiting the same spots again later, we can look back through our pages and go, oh, there's that mysterious looking tree, or, or look, that's that, that sort of looks like that mysterious rock that we've just got a clue for. So it's a really satisfying game in that way, that we can, we can sort of um, map our own adventure, I suppose. And every time we play this, we're, we're revisiting the same things, or possibly um, choosing to revisit the same things because we know that that's where we might need to head because we accidentally went there last time sort of thing. So it's, it's really um, similar to a video game in that regard, I suppose. You know, like you, you, the exploration of the world, you're finding items, you're encountering people that are interesting and interacting with them and you'll choose how you want to interact with them and in one curse you may interact with them one way and in another curse you interact with them another way um, expecting a different result because you think they might have something that you need um, yeah I mean it's hard to explain but it's a big big open world game very very interesting card management system your inventory system is very interesting there's a survival aspect to the game that isn't overwhelming um, a lot of games like 
Robinson Crusoe down there, similar aspect of exploration and survival, but a lot more emphasis on the survival in Robinson Crusoe. The survival in Seventh Continent is really, really tightly tied into the mechanics of the game. You hardly notice it. It's actually quite fun trying to survive in Seventh Continent. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't, anyone that's played the game a couple of times, shouldn't be able to survive well enough in Seventh Continent, especially once you know um, where certain things are on the island. So Seventh Continent, we have a lot of fun with that game. We've probably put 30, 40 hours into that so far. I don't think we've ever actually solved a, a, a curse yet, but we still love the game. And um, yeah, we'll continue to play that for a long, long time. We've got a lot of content. We've just got the expansion for that. Um, it's got another five or six curses or something in that, which is just ridiculous. Like one curse can take 30, 40 hours to complete on a big one. Like maybe not that much, maybe 20 hours. Maybe, maybe 20, 30 hours to complete a big curse in that game. So the content is enormous. Love that game. Mrs. loves that game. That's going to stay in our collection forever. That's my number five, Seventh Continent. And that's why it beats Tigris, because Tigris is hard to get to the table because it's ugly and it's very competitive and people cry when they lose. That is why 7th Continent is number 5 ahead of Tigris. And I suppose that might do it for a minute. Um, kids are up, so I'd better go. I might hit the number 4 through to number 1 a bit later. Those that know my collection might have some idea what I'm going to put in my top 4. Like I said, the top 4, even though I love the games that I've just mentioned, the top 4 really, really stood out to me. And uh, it would be interesting to see if anyone can guess not just what they are, but maybe the order in what they are as well. Um, and the number one in particular was far ahead of the other games. So thanks for watching. I hope everyone keeps safe. And I'll see you next time.